Today's video is extra special because we're celebrating something. It's Ridge's 11 year anniversary sale. But before we dive into that, let me tell you a bit about Ridge Wallet and why it's so fantastic. Look, I've had this wallet for several years now. I've actually, I mean, not this one specifically. This is my latest one from Ridge. As someone who gets sponsored by them, I get the privilege of having a few different options, but I've been using Ridge Wallet as a thing for years and it's fantastic. Basically, you can store, I think it's up to 12 cards in here, although like a normal person, I just have, I've got three, two, but two bank cards, driver's license, an ID in there, just like that, easy. Plus they've got the key case, which is a fantastic addition. And their anniversary sale is on now for a limited time. They've also got a brand new women's line, so that can make a fantastic gift for yourself or a special someone in your life. Indeed, Ridge have also recently launched the leather line, that is natural leather all over there. Very kind of traditional looking and fantastic with all the benefits of Ridge, including RFID blocking technology, by the way, to stop digital pickpockets. They've also got these different colors. Is this like a turquoise? I think this is the turquoise one. They've also got a cobalt blue leather, which I haven't actually got yet. Ridge promised it to me in time for this ad, but it hasn't arrived. There's also a Mopane wood wallet. Still waiting for that, Ridge. I'm excited. With Ridge, you get a lifetime warranty and a 365 day risk free trial. If you don't love it, they've got you covered. All you need to do is click the link below or go to ridge.com slash shadows and you'll get up to 30% off. So, Thanks to Ridge for sponsoring this video. Treat yourself to some Ridge goodness. And now into today's video. Ask his students and he might have been a visionary. Ask his contemporaries and he might have been a mad scientist. Ask the experts of today and he might have been a monster. Of all the myriad pioneers of psychological research, there are few with a reputation quite so as extreme as Dr. Harry F. Harlow, whose work on dependency, social isolation, and maternal separation laid the groundwork for entire fields of modern study, but did so at a shocking cost to his subjects, and in doing so was one of the primary reasons why ethics and psychology are regulated with such critical importance today. In today's episode of Into the Shadows, we're going to be digging into the demented scientific research of Harry Harlow, its cruel and unusual design, its critical revelations on the nature of interpersonal attachment, and the stunning degree to which Harlow's legacy has shaped the field of psychology today. To understand the Harlow experiments, we first got to understand the man who created them. Born Harry Frederick Israel in Fairfield, Iowa in 1905, the boy who would later become Harry Harlow is an enigma to modern-day biographers. Even today, we know little about his childhood years, except for excerpts from his own unfinished biography, suggesting a distant mother who modern theorists would describe, in part because of Harlow's own work, as avoidant or dismissive. Harlow also implied that he struggled with depression across his life, even in childhood. Although he was a smart boy, he was often bored by his surroundings and even feared from a young age that he might eventually go insane. As a young adult, he made his way to Stanford University, gaining entry via a special aptitude test, but whatever his aptitude might have been, he struggled to express it in his early years as an English major. Beset with atrocious grades after just a semester and clearly not showing a whole lot of promise in the field, Harlow was forced to look for other options. As a relief valve, he employed a tried-and-true tactic among struggling undergraduates of any generation. He became a psych major, then basically hoped for the best. Over the next six years, Harlow would earn first an undergraduate degree and then a doctorate at Stanford, spending most of his time studying directly under one Lewis Madison Terman. His mentor is remembered today for his drastic improvements on the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scales, or basically the modern IQ test, and a long-term study he carried out called the Genetic Studies of Genius, which was about, well, the genetics of genius. However, he was also very into eugenics at the same time that Harlow was studying under him. From what we can tell, Harlow didn't seem to adopt quite those same beliefs, but as we'll see shortly, there's more than one way to be a bit unhinged. Around the same time, he changed his name from Harry Israel to Harry Harlow. It was the early 1930s, and while Harlow himself wasn't Jewish, he feared that having a Jewish-sounding last name would bring negative consequences in both his life and career. The person behind that change, and the one who decided he was to be called Harlow? His mentor, Lewis Terman. From Stanford, Harlow made his way to the University of Wisconsin at Madison to become a professor. Without a laboratory on campus, and without any indication from the university that they intended to give him one, Harlow set up his own research space off campus in what would later be named the Primate Laboratory. Harlow wasn't particularly interested in working with humans, and even though he was conducting his research in psychology's Wild West era, when he probably could have gotten away with some pretty insane research designs, his particular research might have been a step too far for human subject research even before the introduction of modern research ethics. 
Harlow's early work at Madison was done via a local zoo, who supplied him with primates to engage with what he would eventually call the Wisconsin General Testing Apparatus. Basically, a memory and cognition test, the apparatus yielded some fairly interesting results for Harlow, but the most important one of all wasn't actually one that he'd expected to find. Within a few tests of a given primate, Harlow realized that the primates were beginning to figure out strategies to get through the tests that he was running. But although Harlow spent a while trying to figure out how the monkeys were developing those strategies, or learning to learn as he called it, that line of questioning ultimately became a gateway into the one that would make Harlow's entire career. You see, during the time that Harlow was running his first large-scale primate experiments, he decided to put together a breeding colony of monkeys in his lab. The primates he chose were rhesus macaques, an old-world monkey from Southeast Asia with complex social groups, internal familial relationships, and close anatomical and physiological similarities to humans. During the establishment of the breeding colony, Harlow and his students were able to witness firsthand how healthy relationships between baby rhesus monkeys and their mothers developed, and when Harlow decided that he wanted to rear the infant monkeys in a nursery rather than dealing with their protective mothers whenever he wanted to use one in an experiment, he began to notice something else. The nursery raised macaques were coming out differently, not physically, but behaviorally, and Harlow wanted to know why. Harlow and his contemporaries were living at a time in which infant attachment to their parents, especially their mothers, was not well understood. Opinions on the impact of infant separation from a mother ran the gamut. Some theorists postulated that it was to do with a dependent feeding relationship with a mother, purely transactional at first, while others contended that it barely mattered at all. Still others claimed that humans only organized into familial structures and engaged with society to gain steady access to sexual contact. Many famous or well-regarded psychologists of the era advised mothers and fathers not to even hold their children if it wasn't necessary, let alone indulge their cries for fear of spoiling them. As behavioralist John Watson once wrote, apparently, without a hint of irony, do not overindulge them, do not kiss them goodnight, rather give a brief bow and shake their hands before turning off the light. <laughs> Savage, bro. The American standard for nurseries at the time was to intentionally make them cold, distant, and inhospitable to positive attachment. But Harlow, along with a handful of other psychologists at the time, took a different tack. Depending on your perspective, you might say Harlow had a hunch, or you might say that he had more experience than most on the subject after struggling to make sense of his own mother's behavior toward him as a boy. After all, that's the nature of every Freudian slip in psychology, saying one thing and meaning your mother. But regardless, Harlow contended that an infant's bond with its mother mattered very, very much, and that it would have a profound impact on a child not just in infancy, but during the longer course of development as well. Harlow's first really consequential experiment came over 20 years after he first began working at the University of Wisconsin in 1957. By then, he had noticed the strangeness of some of his rhesus monkeys when they were raised away from their mothers, and he decided to run a longer and more organized study. He and his research team began separating infant monkeys from their mothers at birth and raising them in what was essentially complete isolation other than their interaction with the researchers. It seems obvious now, but at the time, it was a surprise for Harlow to learn that this impacted the monkeys severely. Left alone and deprived of stimulus, the monkeys learned to cope in all manner of ways. Zoning out so hard, they appeared to be doing what we now know to be disassociating or pacing incessantly inside their cages or even harming themselves. They proved incapable of interacting with other monkeys when they were eventually given the opportunity to do so, and some were so shaken by the experience that they stopped eating entirely and starved to death. That was already a stunning find, considering how starkly it ran contrary to the wisdom of the time. But Harlow had also picked up one other detail, specifically that the monkeys had shown a common behavior in clinging onto the diapers the research team had given them. Those diapers were made of cloth, and they were soft, and the infant monkeys seemed to be taking comfort in them. That led Harlow toward the question of comfort in a maternal relationship. And the way he went about examining the nature of maternal comfort would write his name into the history books. Harlow's next experiment exposed a new generation of infant monkeys to a pair of surrogate mothers, but not living ones. Each monkey involved in the study would be raised in an enclosure with two dummies, one made of cold and flexible wire and one made of soft cloth. In order to directly challenge his peers' contention that a mother-child relationship was all about accessing food, Harlow ensured that some monkeys would have their milk bottle stored in the cloth mother, while others had it stored in the wire mother. In all cases, no matter which of the surrogate mothers the monkeys had to use to get their milk, they nonetheless spent the vast majority of their time with the cloth mother. 
Monkeys that had a milk-giving wire mother would interact with it only minimally, and usually only to feed. Those that had a milk-giving cloth mother ignored the wire mother entirely. But the real stunner came when those same monkeys were exposed to new environments with new stimuli. When they were placed into those environments with the companionship of the cloth mother, they were curious, interactive, and at times even brave. When they were feeling less brave, they'd retreat back to the cloth mother or even the wire mother for safety. But when they were taken away from their surrogate mothers and placed into the same situations, they broke down, trying to hide, crying, and howling to return to safety. Of all the ways Harley's experiment could have gone, there were few conceivable outcomes that might have screamed the conclusions of him any more conclusively. Harley would also run experiments on infant monkeys that had grown up with only their mothers and no peer exposure, and when those monkeys showed fear and aggressiveness when exposed to same age peers, Harley's takeaways grew stronger still in their conviction. The infant mother relationship wasn't only about food, and in fact, it didn't even need food as a central component. Instead, it was all about comfort, safety, and security, feelings in which physical contact with the mother seemed to be absolutely critical. The implications for parents of the time were horrifying. After following the advice of the best psychologists of the day, they'd taken steps to raise their children in a way that Harlow had now shown was going to leave their children emotionally and developmentally stunted in the long term. His findings were oh, confirmation to other theorists who'd been struggling to make the same point to the general public, and the idea of comfort as a cornerstone in child development really began to take on. It seems ridiculous to imagine now, but these were, at the time, truly groundbreaking ideas and ones that shook the field of psychology to its core. With his grand thesis on centrality of comfort now firmly interjected into the American public consciousness, Harlow turned his attention back to his flock of rhesus monkeys. Now, the question at hand, would be isolation. We've already mentioned the results of isolation that Harlow observed in his early experiments. That is, the infant monkeys, raised without their mothers and without interaction with any other mothers, proved to be behaviorally strange compared to the monkeys with the normal upbringing. They would stare off into space for hours, harm themselves, and display all other manner of odd impulses in order to cope with their situation, and they proved utterly incapable of interacting with other mothers after living in isolation for so long. Faced with those early results, Harlow did what any psychologist of the mid-20th century would have done. He looked at the situation he had created for his subjects, and he endeavored to make it oh so much worse. In his subsequent studies, Harlow would expose infant monkeys to one of two conditions. Partial social isolation and complete social isolation. In the partial option, the monkeys would be barred from interacting with each other, kept in individual bare wire cages set apart from each other with no means to receive any level of physical comfort. But as it turns out, these monkeys had it easy. The total deprivation group were raised in isolation chambers from basically the moment of birth for periods as long as a total of 15 years. That's well over half the average captive rhesus monkey's entire lifespan. The results were exactly what you would expect. In the totally isolated monkeys, the pacing came back, the disassociation came back, and the withdrawn, curled-up, thumb-sucking behaviors reported by Harlow as non-nutritional sucking came back too. They became hostile to any outside stimulation, including researchers, and showed hostility toward their own bodies as well. But the behaviors were at their worst when these totally isolated monkeys were exposed to others for the first time. For this, we'll quote directly from Harlow, which was published in 1965. No monkey has died during isolation. When initially removed from total social isolation, however, they usually go into state of emotional shock, characterized by autistic self-clutching and rocking. One of six monkeys, isolated for three months, refused to eat after release and died five days later. The autopsy report attributed death to emotional anorexia. A second animal in the same group refused to eat and probably would have died had we not been prepared to resort to forced feeding. In one particularly interesting detail, the emotional anorexia Harlow described appeared most strongly in infants that were isolated for just three months before being exposed to other monkeys. Infants who were isolated for longer periods and matured a bit more in their solitude certainly didn't enjoy their initial exposure to other monkeys, but the results were far less destructive. Harlow also noticed that when the monkeys, particularly the three-month isolates, were given the chance to spend more time with other monkeys around their age, they were able to come out of their shells and even rehabilitate themselves cognitively and socially. In human terms, they are the children salvaged from the orphanage or inadequate home within the first year of life. The monkeys who'd been isolated for longer, however, showed severely impaired recovery and were totally averse to contact play or roughhousing that would be common among normal macaques of the same age. In Harlow's writing, quote, the effects of six months of total social isolation were so devastating and debilitating that we had assumed initially that 12 months of isolation would not produce any additional decrement. This assumption proved to be false. 
12 months of isolation almost obliterated the animals socially. So stunted was the 12-month group's social growth that when it came time to have them interact with normally raised monkeys from a control group, quoting again, the controls became increasingly aggressive toward the helpless isolate animals and might have killed them had we continued social testing. By the end of this run of studies, Harlow had concluded not only that a lack of social interaction could nearly entirely destroy an infant's capacity to function, either at the present age or later in life, but there was only a narrow, critical window for much of the damage to be undone. A three-month-old monkey could be taken out of isolation, placed into Harlow's rough equivalent of a nursery, and shown by their peers how to act. But the same couldn't be said for a six-month or twelve-month-old monkey. By Harlow's extrapolations, those were roughly the same developmental markers as a two-year-old child and a four-year-old child, respectively. And when those monkeys were left to interact only with peers that had also experienced the same isolation, they were able to interact only minimally, using the crude mechanisms they basically invented themselves. Those that eventually had children of their own were sometimes capable of not killing their own infants, but struggled to do anything more than that. But that news did come with one critical caveat. Six-month-old monkeys who were placed into recovery groups not with normal six-month-old peers but normal three-month-old peers had a far better chance of complete social recovery. Now, do you remember when we said earlier that Harlow, when faced by real and fascinating results on attachment, decided to do the mid-20th century psychological thing and make life even more of a living hell for the subjects? Well, it was at this point, in the final years of Harlow's career, that he decided to repeat the cycle one more time. Harlow had always had a soft spot for choosing rather unconventional or even sensationalist names for his own projects, including some that we're not going to mention because we'd rather not have this video demonetized. But the one we do need to discuss is a series of isolation chambers that Harlow referred to as the Pit of Despair. Harlow's intent with this round of studies was to attempt to build a model for understanding depression in animals, and if Harlow was going to do that, then he was going to need some depressed animals. To make that happen, he and his research partner at that time, Stephen Suomi, designed a stainless steel trough that they technically termed a vertical chamber apparatus. Basically, it was a steel pit with a wire mesh floor, a food box, a water bottle holder, with a top design so the monkeys inside couldn't use it to hang or entertain themselves. The sides of it were made to be slippery, sloping down to a narrow point where the monkey inside would barely have room to move. And this time, Harlow's subjects weren't in for monkeys, removed from their mothers at birth. They were monkeys of an age at least three months old, who had already formed bonds with their mothers and their nursery playmates. Harlow's express intention was to shatter those bonds and keep the monkeys in complete isolation and complete darkness for months. The result, of course, was precisely what you might expect. After a day or two spent attempting to escape, the monkeys inside would give up, descend to the bottom of the apparatus, curl up into a ball, and by all outward appearances, languish in their despair with no opportunity to do anything else. As Harlow's collaborator Suomi wrote it later, no monkey was able to guard against the psychological anguish they seemed to experience inside the cage, and none of them emerged without sustaining serious psychological damage for the rest of their lives. After 30 days in the pit, monkeys who were released would refuse to interact with other monkeys, engage with any external stimuli, or even move of their own volition. For the most part, they would remain huddled and attempting to self-soothe by clutching at their own bodies. Those behaviors would persist for months in most cases, and they only got worse the longer a monkey had spent in the pit before release. Then, Harlow and his students would attempt to rehabilitate them in efforts that were basically unsuccessful across the board. Harlow would insist in his later years that the studies had provided data that had major implications for the study of depression. But decades later, those same studies have only been minimally referenced in any work related to treatment. Harlow would die in Tucson, Arizona at the age of 76 in 1981, by which time much of the public reaction to his work was firmly entrenched. With Harlow's publications and the slow evolution of his work from the genuinely groundbreaking to the increasingly macabre, his name had become the source of powerful controversies within the scientific community and controversies that would only grow more and more intense after the end of his life. Now, Before we get into the many, many, many negatives of Harlow's work, we do need to take a moment and acknowledge the real value of what he achieved. Harlow's work on the importance of maternal attachment came at a time when it was desperately needed, and when conventional wisdom suggested that children were best left stranded in social and parental isolation. Harlow's work 
clearly demonstrated, and later studies have since confirmed that such treatment of children, whether monkey or human, would seriously stunt a child's ability to grow, erase critical social skills, and have an impact that would echo throughout the rest of their lives. For his work, Harlow won national acclaim in the United States, and he was even named president of the APA, or the American Psychological Association, which governs academics across the entire field of psychological research. But Harlow's work also made him one of a few members of one of modern psychology's most exclusive clubs, the researchers whose work inspired the creation of ethical standards in human and animal psychological research, not because of the lessons Harlow's research taught anybody, but to ensure that research like it could never take place again. One of Harlow's own former students, University of Washington professor Gene Sackett, has since explained how Harlow's experiments basically kicked off the animal liberation movement in the US and forced America to reckon with the treatment of animals in laboratory settings. Today, the use of lab animals is tightly regulated by the APA and other governing bodies who refuse to sponsor, endorse, or even allow the use of research institutions for human or animal experimentation that is deemed to have too great of a risk of harm to its subjects. When it comes to educating the next generation of psychologists, Harlow's example and the sheer visceral horror it evokes in the people who learn about it made it a flagship case of what not to do. Ask a first-year undergraduate psychology student at any American university, fresh off an introductory class, and they may or may not be able to explain the mechanisms of interpersonal attachment or the models that guide our understanding of human or animal depression, but they sure as hell know about Harlow's monkeys and could probably recount a detailed explanation from their professors or teaching assistants on just why research like that is a bad idea. Harlow's personal reputation hasn't survived either. And it's not as if he helped his own case in trying to preserve it. In his later years, he would reveal to interviewers and students his disdain for the monkeys that he'd used as subjects, including this gem of a quote from 1974, which I'm going to read to you while the editor of this video shows you a picture of baby rhesus monkeys. The only thing I care about is whether the monkeys will turn out a property I can publish. I don't have any love for them. Never have. I really don't like animals. I despise cats. I hate dogs. How could you like a monkey? Routinely, Harlow would attempt to frame any disputes around the welfare of his animals as a matter of public relations or perception, and would dismiss any genuine care for the animals shown by as many critics as either being misguided or fabricating their concern outright. As another of his former students said later in life, despite him continuing deprivation experiments with animal subjects, quote, it's as if he sat down and said, I'm only going to be around another 10 years. What I'd like to do then is leave a great big mess behind. This was his aim. He did a perfect job. Not only that, but Harlow's own motivations for conducting some of his most questionable studies have been repeatedly called into question. As we alluded to before, this was a man who devoted his life to studying mother-child attachment and often ripping away that attachment from his subjects after having been deprived of such attachment himself. There were side experiments we didn't even mention before, including the use of a surrogate mother machine that attacked baby monkeys with spikes or cold air to simulate real-life abuse. The results, by the way, showed that those baby monkeys were still unable to bring themselves to stop seeking comfort from the evil but cloth-covered abusive surrogates. Harlow's later Pit of Despair experiments came at a time in his life when Harlow himself entered a well of despair following the death of his second wife after a long battle with cancer. With his own personal depression came disinterest in attachment and far more of an interest in isolation of his subjects. When asked by another faculty member at the University of Wisconsin why on earth Harlow was using these demented bits for his research, Harlow reportedly responded, because that's how it feels when you're depressed. One of his former doctoral students it worked with during the pit of despair years has since explained that he had to be talked out of an even more descriptive name, the Dungeon of Despair, for fears of how the university and Harlow's own peers might react. Other critics pointed out that the Pit of Despair research was generating results that might have been shocking in the 1950s. For example, the idea that living organisms might experience negative effects because of social deprivation, but well understood by the time those later experiments actually took place. Said writer Wayne Booth, Harry Harlow and his colleagues go on torturing their non-human primates decade after decade, invariably proving what we all knew in advance, that social creatures can be destroyed by destroying their social ties. In retrospect, it's impossible to dismiss the life and work of Harry Harlow in its entirety. Modern nurseries, social services, maternity wards, and countless individual relationships between mothers, fathers, and their children have been fundamentally changed for the better because of what Harlow was able to show the world with his studies. But at the same time, Harlow left behind a long and indisputable legacy of intense pain and even depravity in the name of science. Harlow and his work did indeed 
represent progress, but at a price of decades of unyielding cruelty. He was a man, one part visionary, one part mad scientist, and one part pure madman. The world wouldn't be the same without him, and yet it is imperative that the field of psychology never hosts a figure quite like him again.